Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Dr. Psych Mom Show. Um, today, I am going to talk about how you may have to go back to a different stage in order to understand your partner. And um, some people hesitate to do this because it may feel silly to them or it may feel condescending or something, and I'll discuss that, but why this can be an effective cognitive tool to help you reframe and, as always, gain perspective on your partner's internal world, which is lacking in many unhappy relationships. Before that, I must tell you to subscribe. Most recent subscriber episode was on love addiction, and I have about 160 of them now that you can listen to if you just subscribe for $8.99 a month. So that is a pretty wide, uh, you know, vast resource. If you make use of it fully, you get 25% more episodes. Okay, so what do I mean by going back to a different stage? So, or um, And how does this manifest differently for men versus women? Okay, so as I've always said, as I say um, in my posts, etc., you have to listen to your wife's content and not her Sorry, her emotion and not her content sometimes because frequently your wife is upset and she can't really verbalize it. And then I say you would do this with your kids. I say this to men all the time. And then, of course, the man says she doesn't want me to treat her like the kids because she's not a child. And I say, yeah, but meanwhile, no time that I've ever said this in couple session did a woman say, yes, I agree. Don't treat me like a child. No. What they say is, if that's how you got to think of it to be nice to me, cool. Great. Think of me like a child then in that way. Because in reality, we all have our child self still within us. And it comes to the surface more when you're dysregulated or you need comfort or you're halt, hungry, anxious, lonely, tired. Um, as I mentioned in an earlier podcast, that's the acronym for when people may be at risk of using if they're addicted to a substance is when they're halt, hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. It's a good acronym for anybody to understand when they may act more dysregulated, right? But anyway, so I tell the man, okay, so your wife is saying something like, um, well, uh, you don't even love me, Right? So the content of that is an assertion. It's a philosophy statement. You don't even love me. A declarative sentence about the state of the world. And then the man seeks to, you know, debate that and show the evidence for the counter argument that, in fact, he does love her because he goes to work every day and comes home and gives, you know, her the majority of that money and goes to pumpkin festivals and uh, does the bedtime routine that she wants for the children that he thinks is excessive and uh, he is sexually faithful despite being sexually uh, not entirely thrilled with her, etc. But what does it really mean? It's like the podcast I did on what is what to say when your wife says, you never kiss me. You never come in the door and kiss me. I say to come over and give her a kiss because the, the emotion is that she feels unloved. So in that scenario, it's the same thing. When she says, you don't even love me, what she wants you to say is, I love you so much, my sweetheart. You're the best thing in the whole world, and I love you, and I'm so sorry if I made you feel like I don't love you. And things could be repaired in like one second. Now, it would be the same thing, by the way, if a man says, we never have sex. So, of course, you have sex, and many women do the exact same thing. They don't respond to the emotion like they would with their child. If their child said, you never feed me a snack, <laughs> you know, you wouldn't give him all of the uh, times you fed him a snack. That could be later when you would say that. You might wonder if he was feeling okay, you know, like if he, if he just said it to you like, well, you've never fed me a snack, you'd be like, well, yes, I have. I've done this, this, and this. But if he yelled it, he was very upset. He said, you never feed me a snack. You might think that he was hungry, right? Or that he had just seen another child offered a snack and he didn't get one. There would be some emotion that you would respond to in the moment contingently. You would respond to the emotion of the child being upset. So if a man says, we never have sex, a lot of women break out their own equivalent of the spreadsheet, which is kind of just a little mental list. And they say, well, yes, we had sex last Monday, I think. It might have been Tuesday. I know it was last week sometime. And then also we did it two weeks before that. And then before that, I think we did it once in twice in one week. And that was great. And so thus you are wrong. When in reality, what he means is like, I don't feel like you love me. We don't have a physical affectionate relationship. Our sex life is 
is nothing to write home about, and this all worries me very much and makes me feel unloved, right? So the appropriate response, if she was listening to the emotion, would be, uh, you know, I love you, I'm sorry, I've not really been in the mood, and maybe we could do it tonight, right? Something like that that's reassuring. So in this case, why I bring up these examples is with a child, you respond to the emotion. So it's helpful to remember what it's like to be a child when your spouse is dysregulated. Because that's the last time, especially if you identify as a super rational person, that you may have felt dysregulated. Of course you have, but many men especially almost feel like they've not experienced almost any dysregulation since childhood. So then in that case, go back to childhood and think about when you were kind of really stressed out and you felt completely powerless about something and like the other person was making all of your decisions and you you just couldn't get your needs met in whatever way. Nobody could kind of understand you when you feel like an upset child. That's how your spouse feels. So that's one way that you could go back to a different stage to remember how it feels and then to use that empathy to respond differently to your spouse. In that case, you would say, what would I feel if I was a dysregulated child? I would just want to be cuddled and loved and comforted and reassured. And so that's what I should do for my spouse. Now, you could also use it in real specific ways. So for example, women that are in perimenopause or menopause, it's hard to even remember what it's like to um, have, be really driven by your sex drive, right? Because you don't feel it anymore. And so some women make a huge cognitive error of assuming that because they feel X, Y, Z way at age 47 or 55 or 62, then their same age partner or similar age partner would feel the same. And that is in fact the way that humans would feel at those ages. And therefore, um, when the partner is dissatisfied sexually, that is the partner's fault because you are the similar aged person and you realize that sex is kind of not a big deal anymore. So shouldn't that person remember the same thing? But they're not the same as you, right? So they have a different body, different brain, different hormone levels, and often different gender, right? So in these cases, it can be a real eye opener for the woman to put herself in the perspective of how she felt when she was 18, right? And this is why, you know, it it can be the most, the least responsive couples cases, the most intractable I was going to say, are when the woman or the man is asexual or has never had desire, you know, has never really understood the point of sex at all because then they have nothing to go back to in their mind. Whereas if the woman used to have a higher sex drive, which is the majority of cases, she used to like sex and just, you know, it's gone down over time or for any of the myriad reasons that I discuss ad nauseum in my uh, podcast and on my blog. So, it's just gone down, but she can, if she tries, remember what it used to feel like. Like she, you know, empathizes like all day long with her kids. Well, I'm not 13, but when I was, I felt really self-conscious and I felt really insecure. So that must be how my daughter feels, right? So, so it's easier to do it in those cases for one's children. And as I discuss a lot, it's easier for people in general to empathize with their children because there's no bitterness and water under the bridge like there is in the marital relationship frequently. There's no expectation that the child should know better the way that you would think that an adult should know better when in reality, there's no reason to think that because everybody ages differently, everybody has different issues, everybody has different backgrounds and triggers, etc. So it's frequently very useful for the woman to say, okay, this is how I feel at 45, but he still feels like I did at 25 or at 35. So at 25, if I rolled over and I wanted to have sex with him and he said no, I would have probably gotten pretty upset. Some women would say, oh, I would have stormed out. You know, I would have started to cry. And not just because of the rejection, but because of the physiological frustration. I, in fact, have a podcast about that that says, um, like, if your wife isn't grumpy, if she doesn't get the dick, like, that's a bad sign. (laughs) Um, or that's in the description. I forget. If your wife's never experienced sexual frustration, then that's why she thinks you're coercive is probably what it is. And then in the Facebook group, somebody uh, had done a little video on that same topic before the podcast came out, as I frequently do, which is why you should follow me on social media to get the taste of what's coming. But anyway, so he said in the Facebook group that um, if a woman isn't grumpy when she doesn't get the dick, then like that's a bad sign for her later libido, which I concur with. And I included that, I think, in my podcast or in the description of it. And so many women can remember feeling physiologically dysregulated and physically frustrated when they didn't have sex. They just assume that both partners 
that go that changes kind of in lockstep, like linearly, both partners in a marriage experience the decline. Um, and nobody ever really feels like that anymore after years. And to think that the man still does, you know, because of his higher testosterone level, et cetera, feel that way, you know, that can be an eye opener. So she would have to go back to a phase where she was at her sexual prime, which is, of course, as I always discuss, when the mammal is young and fertile, you know, and there can be other issues of why somebody would hit their prime later, most of those, you know, are like easily explained. Like she's gone off birth control, which was artificially lowering her libido for the years of her actual sexual prime, or she finally dealt with her sexual trauma history in her uh, in personal therapy, or she got divorced and therefore she's in a new honeymoon stage with every man she meets. So, um, but in, in the cases of, of long-term monogamy without a chemical change, it is very rare for, for a woman, obviously, to have a higher sex drive when she's less fertile. But anyway, it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Some people have wonky stuff happen around perimenopause and they go get their blood tested and their testosterone's high and their other stuff's low and whatever, it works out for them. But on average, we're talking about for all animals, you know, sex drive is going to be the highest when you are young and fertile. But anyway, so this idea about going to a different stage in your mind can be very, very useful in promoting empathy. And sometimes you have to go all the way back to childhood or whenever you felt very physically um, easily dysregulated and in need of comfort and physically weak too. Because a lot of women in particular experience depression at higher rates than men and that can co-vary with, as I've talked about, atypical depression symptoms are fatigue and sleeping too much and lead-in paralysis and and basically you feel like you can't do anything physically, you know? And for a man, I have a post, like, is your testosterone preventing you from empathizing with your wife? It says, like, listen, like, what seems easy to you may not seem easy to her. And I think in, I feel like I did talk about this, but probably it was long enough ago that many of you haven't heard this anecdote. Um, but when I was at the beach, with my husband and my kids as they were a couple years ago, so they were smaller, you know, and they were little enough that you would think that they may not know where they were going or they could get lost or something. And there was a lot of people around. And I said, uh, I was anxious that they were not close enough for me to see them because there was a crowd and they had walked down on the boardwalk and we were not on the boardwalk. And then he was like, well, I could just go get them. We know which direction they went. I could just go get them like whenever you want me to. And so I realized that he could see further. He's like a foot taller. He could see further. He could see them quicker and he could walk or certainly run way faster. So physiologically, I felt more anxious for a reason, right? Like I did not feel like I could easily just go in their direction and find them. That wouldn't have been easy for me to do. So then biologically, I felt more fear in that situation about my offspring, you know, than he did. But that isn't because he's like a, like a calmer person overall, like in that moment, what that was, was literally biology, you know, like that was, <laughs> that was like, like, like a man and a woman with a newborn baby. And, you know, the woman is nursing and the man can't nurse. And if they were each alone with the baby, the man would be more scared that the baby would die because he can't feed the baby out of his own body. So if they were both trapped in an elevator with a newborn baby, then the man would be more anxious than the woman probably because he can't feed the baby, right? I could not quickly get to the children. So that um, is an anecdote that I use to show there is really obvious but not explained and not really explicitly conscious variables that allow men to be calmer in many situations. And of course, you know, with any sort of risk or danger, testosterone is a very protective factor. It makes you feel more risk-taking and more, you know, confident than, than women feel. Women have higher rates of anxiety. But sometimes that's really literally... I mean, it's always due to physiological variables, hormones are physiological, but it's also due to kind of physical strength and size and just different body capacities. So it's like, you know, it's, it's kind of like how women don't get anxious before sex, you know, the way that a man would get anxious about performance. What's her performance? I mean, hopefully it's not just this, but the, the, she could just kind of lay there and have had sex. He can't, right? He has to get hard and he has to have sex. He has to 
he he has to physically perform. So how we are, we are, we cannot be separated from our bodies, right? And so the way that our bodies are physiologically, anatomically, and hormonally really mediate our perception and our consciousness within the world and our experience. So if you're thinking, why is my wife so fucking irritating about when she can't see the kids in a crowd? Maybe it's because she doesn't feel any confidence that she could get them like you do. She's not as loud as you are. She's not as fast as you are. She's not as tall as you are. Literally, it's going to be more of a dangerous situation in theory. And even if intellectually she knows not much bad could happen, physiologically, if you do not see your young offspring, that's a problem. I just watched a little video of a baby panda who was taken by its, from its mother at the zoo for a checkup. And the mother was like real anxious, even though we would assume that's been done before in the little panda's lifespan. She probably knows panda's coming back, but it's very evolutionary. You know, you don't want your offspring not to be in your sight. So it's kind of an interesting way to think about it so that as a man, you would have to think, how would I have felt in this crowd when I was physically smaller and weaker and slower? Literally, oh, I would have been anxious. I would have been more anxious, possibly, especially before my testosterone came online and I shot up and, and all of these things. So it, it's, it's always very interesting to think about how you can get a better perspective on your spouse's um, internal world and how that can make you a better partner because you're empathizing with them and you're understanding them better. And in terms of your husband, you got to think about when you have felt your best, your strongest and your most confident, your most, again, this is when you were younger. So sex drive co-varies obviously with general confidence and youth and vitality, etc. So for a woman who's like very kind of anxious and, uh, um, you know, less, less confident, let's say in her 50s, menopause has been really difficult and she's had a couple of uh, really bad things happen, you know, with the kids or parenting or the or her, her own parents or whatever. She's taken some knocks in life. She doesn't remember maybe what it's like to be so confident. So her husband comes off to her as very insensitive because he's so confident about, oh, things will work out. So she's got to go back to a time where she thought like that. You know, when she was younger, when she's like 22 years old, she's just graduating college. She's on the cusp of everything. See, you have this dumb job. Who cares? It'll probably work out anyway. You're living in the middle of a shitty part of the city. Who cares? I'm invulnerable. Nothing will happen to me. That's mediated by youth, vitality, hormones, etc. He's still there in many ways. He still thinks many things would be adventurous that you don't think would be. So you'd have to think, oh, oh, I see. It would, it would be like I used to think in that way. He's more like I used to be when I was younger, you know, in that way. And so I can see it differently there. All right. Well, I hope that this guys, that this gave you guys a different and interesting perspective on how to empathize with your partner. This one is certainly one that you could bring up having listened to. This probably is not going to offend anybody. If it were to offend somebody, then they are probably going to get offended by many things and y'all should be in couples counseling. Um, to deal with that. Okay, talk to everybody soon. Have a great day, guys. Bye-bye.